This episode of Real Science is brought to you by CuriosityStream. Watch dozens of space documentaries and get free access to Nebula for just $14.79 a year by signing up at curiositystream.com slash real science. Venus, the second planet from the sun and sometimes referred to as Earth's twin. Nearly the same size with about the same mass and both with significant atmospheres, the two planets seem like they should be very much alike. But in spite of their similarities, Venus is a toxic hellscape in comparison to Earth. Temperatures can reach more than 400 degrees Celsius, and the pressure there is staggering. It's more than 90 times higher than on Earth. Standing on the surface of Venus would be like standing 900 meters below the ocean surface in terms of pressure. And all this pressure and heat is due to its monstrously thick atmosphere. 100 kilometers of the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide with poison clouds made of sulfuric acid. The crushing pressure and immense heat make Venus a particularly hard place to explore. While we have heard many stories about Mars rovers, we've never heard about a Venus rover because there's never been one. The longest mission to the surface of Venus was a stationary lander that survived for only two hours. It's so hot on the surface there that metals like lead would completely melt and the pressure is so high it could crush a nuclear submarine. So the idea of any life being there has always seemed far outside the realm of possibility. Its extreme environment has caused most scientists to set their sights elsewhere when searching for extraterrestrial life. Planets like Mars or Jupiter's moon Europa or Saturn's moon Enceladus have taken center stage in the search. But for decades, other experts have postulated something different that life may indeed be possible on Venus, not on its sweltering surface, but within its thick clouds. In 1967, Carl Sagan wrote, while the surface conditions of Venus make the hypothesis of life there implausible, the clouds of Venus are a different story altogether. And now, 53 years later, scientists may have found the first sign of this hypothesis being true, phosphine gas, detected in extremely high levels in the atmosphere of Venus. Phosphine gas doesn't sound like much of anything to most of us, but it has scientists around the world extremely excited. Is there reason to be excited? What is it about phosphine gas that could indicate life? And how could life even be possible in such an extreme environment? Phosphine gas is a substance that we know of as something to be avoided here on Earth. It's a colorless, flammable, very toxic gas with the chemical formula PH3. It was used as a chemical weapon during World War I and is used today as an agricultural fumigant. It's also a poisonous byproduct of meth labs, hence Walter White's heavy-duty hazmat suit. It's a dangerous substance that seems antithetical to the idea of life as we know it. But phosphine can be a byproduct of life specifically by some species of anaerobic bacteria, organisms that live in environments with no oxygen, such as marshes, landfills, or inside animal guts. And unless we humans have manufactured the phosphine, the only way we know of that it can be made on rocky planets like ours is from these microbes. For this reason, earlier this year, scientists determined it to be an appropriate biosignature gas. Biosignature gases are ones that are produced by life and accumulate in an atmosphere to detectable levels and help guide scientists in their quest of looking for life on other planets. On Earth, the majority of life is centered around oxygen. It's a byproduct of photosynthesis and it's subsequently used by other forms of life to breathe. Methane and nitrous oxide would also be among Earth's biosignature gases but scientists are aware that focusing on these gases alone would be a very Earth-centric approach. Alien life could very well exist in non-Earth-like environments, such as a place with no oxygen. And just like in the anaerobic environments within Earth, a planet with no oxygen could still produce phosphine as a sign of life. And making phosphine an even more compelling biosignature is the fact that it doesn't form easily. When investigating a potential biosignature, Scientists have to be careful to consider all other possible origins of the biosignature in question. Something like methane or oxygen in an atmosphere could plausibly be explained by a number of chemical processes. But phosphine? It takes extremely specific thermodynamic conditions for it to form outside of biological life. 
it needs extremely high temperatures and plenty of elemental hydrogen. Scientists don't know of any way phosphine can be produced on a planet that is less than 527 degrees Celsius. The gas giant Jupiter, for example, has high levels of phosphine gas. It forms there in the hottest, deepest layers of the atmosphere, where hydrogen is abundant. But on rocky planets like Earth and Venus, lower temperatures, pressures, and hydrogen quantities in the atmosphere make phosphine gas an almost impossible presence. So when researchers pointed their array of telescopes called ALMA at Venus, they almost could not believe what they were seeing. ALMA can detect the energy emitted and absorbed by any phosphine molecules spinning in the atmosphere. And what it detected was far more phosphine than even exists on Earth. 20 parts per billion versus Earth's 7 or so parts per trillion. If phosphine really is in the atmosphere of Venus, then its presence indicates something extraordinary happening. Either something is creating phosphine on Venus in an unanticipated chemical event, or alien life is producing phosphine gas as a byproduct, just like the anaerobic bacteria on Earth. One event is obviously more extraordinary than the other, but scientists are now scrambling to figure out which one it is. To understand how life may have started on Venus, let's consider how it started on Earth. For decades, scientists have debated the origins of life, and it's largely still shrouded in mystery. However, most theories do include a common set of environmental conditions considered vital for life. Liquid water, needed to dissolve molecules to facilitate chemical reactions. Mild temperatures, needed because temperatures higher than 122 degrees Celsius destroy most complex organic molecules. A process to concentrate molecules, needed to take the diluted organic compounds in the environment and bring them together. A complex natural environment, with a diverse range of temperatures, pH levels, and salt concentrations, needed to create the chemical complexity that life requires and trace metals needed to promote the formation of organic molecules. When looking at this ingredient list, it seems rather unlikely that Venus could actually give rise to life. Its surface temperatures of over 400 degrees Celsius means that no liquid water can be present, and the heat would also break down any organic molecules. However, like Carl Sagan postulated in the 1960s, if you go up to the middle of the cloud layer on Venus, temperatures and pressures become rather Earth-like. Water droplets could form, and electric discharge in the clouds could possibly lead to the formation of organic molecules like methane. And perhaps there, life could indeed form. But this theory falls apart pretty quickly when you consider what these clouds are made of, sulfuric acid. This hyperacidic environment would break down any free-floating organic compounds. So with its extremely hot surface and hyperacidic atmosphere, Venus today is no place for life to form, but this may not have always been the case. Recent computer modeling shows that early Venus was very similar to early Earth, with shallow oceans and mild temperatures for up to 2 billion years of its early history. Scientists simulated conditions of a hypothetical early Venus with an atmosphere similar to Earth's, a day as long as Venus's current day, spinning once for every 117 Earth days and a shallow ocean consistent with early data from the Pioneer spacecraft. The study also factored in an ancient sun that was up to 30% dimmer. Because of the slow spin of Venus, its day side is exposed to the sun for almost two Earth months at a time. Their modeling showed that on an early oceanic Venus, this could have warmed the surface and produced rain that created a thick layer of clouds, which acted like an umbrella to shield the surface from much of the sun's heat. Some NASA scientists think this means that Venus's early temperatures could have actually been a few degrees cooler than Earth's today. And under these conditions, perhaps life could have formed. Some researchers are proposing that if the phosphine detected in Venus's atmosphere is a sign of life, that this life is a relic of a previous biosphere, an ancient remnant of a once thriving ecosystem that eventually collapsed due to the runaway greenhouse effect that created present conditions. If life formed back then, it might have adapted to spread into the clouds when intense climate change boiled the oceans away, killing the rest of the biosphere. Microbes in the clouds may have become the last survivors on Venus. And while life existing suspended in clouds seems unheard of, it's an idea that is actually not so alien to life here on Earth. 
In 2005, researchers used a balloon to collect samples from different levels of Earth's stratosphere at heights ranging from 20 to 41 kilometers. And in all, 12 bacterial and six fungal colonies were detected. Since then, microbes from every major biological lineage have been detected in Earth's upper atmosphere. This strange microbe behavior could perhaps then also be plausible on Venus. But this still doesn't address the extremely acidic conditions in the clouds of Venus and its lethality to life as we know it. Even the most durable extremophiles that live in acidic conditions on Earth can withstand only around 5% acid. The conditions in the clouds of Venus are over 90% acid. This, by the way, is also why we can rule out the idea that any of our Venus probes accidentally dropped off these microbes. Anything from Earth could not survive there. But just as life has moved into every nook and cranny on Earth, from hot springs to volcanic fields, maybe the same can be true on Venus, and the organisms have adapted to the acidity. The supposed alien life living in that environment would have to exist in some form unknown to us, either somehow withstanding or protecting their carbon bonds from the acid, or existing as non-carbon-based life forms with different chemical bonds altogether. But before we can get too excited about the idea of phosphine indicating alien life, scientists still need to rule out any other possible chemical reaction happening on Venus that could lead to the production of phosphine. The researchers carefully examined other possible origins of the gas, like a chemical reaction driven by lightning, volcanic activity, or delivery by meteorites. They noted that while lightning can occur on Venus, it happens much less than on Earth and would fall short of producing the energy required to create phosphine. They also estimated that there would need to be more than 200 times as much volcanic activity on Venus as on Earth to inject enough PH3 into the atmosphere to be detectable. And while there are thousands of volcanoes on Venus, as far as we can tell, none of them are active. A recent study found a few that may be dormant, not dead, but in general, there is not enough volcanic activity going on to account for the phosphine. And even if every single one of those volcanoes was active, the researchers believe that the maximum production of phosphine by volcanoes on any planet, even ones with tons of hydrogen, is at least seven orders of magnitude lower than the surface fluxes required for detection. And assuming Venus receives the same amount of meteorites as Earth per year, this would deliver a negligible amount of phosphorus. Such meteorites contain an average of 0.25% phosphorus by weight, and even conservatively assuming that 100% of that phosphorus could be hydrolyzed to pH 3, these meteors would deliver a maximum of around 10 tons of pH 3 every year, not enough to account for what was detected on Venus. Scientists simply don't know of any way phosphine can be produced on a planet with these temperatures and pressures and with limited hydrogen. But this doesn't mean it's impossible. Even the authors of the paper say that they emphasize that the detection of pH3 is not robust evidence for life, only for anomalous and unexplained chemistry. Other scientists doubt that the phosphine detection itself is even real. The signal detected was faint, and an extensive amount of processing was needed to pull it from the data returned by the telescopes. That processing could have returned an artificial signal at the same frequency as phosphine. However, the researchers have repeated their findings on two different telescope arrays, the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope and ALMA, and found a nearly identical pattern of detection. There is certainly enough here to be excited, but perhaps just not about alien life just yet. If the researchers can confirm the phosphine detection beyond a shadow of a doubt, and they continue to not be able to explain it, the next step will have to be sending a spacecraft to Venus to check out exactly what is going on, collecting samples of the gas, or even of the possible alien life. As Carl Sagan once said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And as the planetary science community sets its priorities for the next decade of space exploration, Venus has just rocketed to the front of the list. If you're like me, all this talk about space in the news and the possibility of life on other planets has reignited a curiosity that I had let dwindle over time. It's something we grow up intrinsically excited about, and then life inevitably gets in the way. It's been a while since I've laid in the grass and looked up at the stars and really let the incredible weirdness and vastness of it all sink in. 
but since wrapping my head around what this phosphine discovery on Venus means, I have nothing but the urge to drive away from the city lights and do just that. I think learning about space and understanding the significance of recent discoveries can let the curiosity buried in us start to come out again. So if you need a break from our current reality, want to ponder the vastness of the universe, or perhaps reignite a lost interest in the cosmos, you should check out the space exploration documentaries on CuriosityStream. This eight-part series called The Planets, made by the BBC, in particular, is one to add to your binge list. The episode called Giants, for example, explains the one discovery that made the dream of a flight to the giant planets a reality, and shows how scientists navigated what seemed impossible, sending the Voyager probe billions of miles from Earth to get a closer look at the outermost planets of our solar system. CuriosityStream has so many high-quality documentaries like this on any of the subjects you want to learn more about. And to make it even better, CuriosityStream has partnered with Nebula. Nebula is a streaming platform that I helped make with some of the best educational content creators, like Real Engineering, Wendover Productions, TierZoo, and Polyphonic. It's a place where we can experiment with content without worrying about the YouTube algorithm. Nebula allows us to take our time producing content and open so many creative doors. Because of this, there is a range of awesome content you can find there. Original long-form documentaries, or, as of recently, a new section for original podcasts, like the Showmakers podcast, where in the latest episode, Brian from Real Engineering and Sam from Wendover Productions interview me about my scientific and creative background. So if you sign up for CuriosityStream at curiositystream.com slash real science, you'll get a subscription to CuriosityStream and a subscription to Nebula for now just $14.79 a year, 26% off the usual price. By signing up, you're not just supporting this channel, but all of your favorite educational content creators. Thanks for watching, and if you'd like to see more from me, the links to my Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon are below.